now that we've seen this trajectory, uh, kind of a descriptive level of how it unfolds, we're going to turn to this more fundamental question of how does it work? How do, what are the mechanisms that are driving these kind of uh, developmental processes? This is such a complicated uh, problem that we really, it's really on the frontier of what we understand. So, you know, some of the things that are going on here, you have brain maturation processes. So this continued genetically kind of programmed developmental uh, construction of the brain is an ongoing process. It doesn't stop, you know, when we come out of the womb. Um, you have, of course, all this learning that we've been emphasizing, how brain maturation interacts with learning uh, is a very, very interesting developmental question. Trying to characterize the nature of this learning process at a more cognitive level, Piaget talked about these notions of kind of schemas, this idea that we have these kind of concepts of how the world works, these simplifying compression kinds of ideas about how we categorize the world and then how those schemas uh, kind of change and adapt over the course of experience and learning. So these processes of assimilation and accommodation were critical to the Piaget framework. Of course, you have all these internal motivational drives that, that are shaping our behavior. Uh, and then as we've emphasized so much, how many of these forces that we experience developmentally that are really shaping us are kind of social in nature. So we know kind of all these different forces that are at work here, uh, but we don't really know, again, how exactly they all play out in the, in the developmental process. One thing that has been studied extensively is this process of brain maturation. And this takes place primarily in the form of synaptic pruning. So it turns out that our brains are, are being sculpted uh, by this uh, developmental process that we start out as this big kind of unformed block of marble, if you will. Uh, and then the maturational process is one of a sculptor kind of cutting stuff away and revealing the amazing work of art that is our brain. Um, and so that sculpting process is documented here uh, showing you from age five to 20, uh, the areas that are still undergoing more of this synaptic pruning uh, at each point along development. And so the blue areas here are the ones that have kind of stabilized in their overall uh, brain volume. So as you prune synapses, you reduce the, the volume of these, uh, these parts of the brain. And so these are kind of the mature levels, uh, but you still see even at this point, a little bit of further uh, pruning activity taking place in the frontal and temporal lobes. This is where our kind of conceptual and kind of cognitive control areas are that we've talked about so many times, language, cognitive control, semantics. So that's what's still kind of still exhibiting this developmental pruning level uh, uh, plasticity at this latest stage. And if you kind of trace back from there, you can see still frontal uh, and very intensely kind of frontal areas in these intermediate kind of adolescent areas. And much is made of how the adolescent is very much still in this process of developing the frontal cortex. And so you have all this kind of basic knowledge and understanding of the world, but you're still kind of lacking that ability to control your behavior because your frontal cortex is not sufficiently developed at that point. Um, and then especially early on here at age five, you see kind of this motor frontal uh, cognitive uh, perceptual, all these areas are still extensively kind of being pruned, which means that the initial learning is kind of being solidified and locked into place. Once those synapses get pruned, um, it makes the overall brain function more efficient. Uh, that is also a precursor for some of the myelination. So this wrapping of the axons in this kind of uh, fatty sheath to insulate them allows for faster communication. So it's kind of optimizing the, the structure that's been learned, we think that the pruning is very much uh, uh, feeding off of the long-term potentiation and depression, the LTD and LTP learning processes that we talked about in the learning chapter. And so essentially, you know, your brain is starting out very plastic, learning all kinds of things. And then this process of pruning is kind of locking in and optimizing what's learned uh, as you go along. And a consequence of this is the idea that uh, it's then harder later to really reshape your brain circuits 
you've sort of uh, really pruned away all the potential uh, for forming new kind of totally different kinds of pathways in your brain. Uh, and so you have to essentially get by with tweaking the existing pathways. And that's why it's sort of hard to teach an old dog new tricks, so to speak. Uh, once, once you've got uh, those pathways kind of solidified and pruned, they're much less plastic. Okay, so this really gives us a good sense of kind of, a, an, again, an abstract kind of just level of understanding kind of what, what that's happening, but you know, exactly how these mechanisms play out uh, uh, is, is, is less well understood. So now we can go back and unpack some of this early sensory motor phase of learning that Piaget described within the first two years. And really, uh, so the first six months is this critical window of basic perceptual understanding of the world. Uh, up until about six months, you're not doing too much capable form of motor control. You're not crawling, et cetera. Um, and so that's just this really early perceptual understanding of the world. Studies have shown that babies at this phase develop an understanding of like uh, how physical uh, events un uh, unfold in uh, the perceptual world. They can sort of learn to tell the difference between kind of magic types of physical uh, behavior versus kind of predictable uh, behavior that follows the laws of physics. So, uh, you know, if a ball is rolling behind a barrier and then it doesn't come out the other side, after about six months, they'll start to get surprised by that. So this idea that, you know, they're sort of realizing that these objects should continue to exist, a basic form of object permanence, um, this idea that objects need to be supported by some visible form of support. They don't just kind of levitate in the air. Uh, these basic, basic understandings of kind of physical interactions of objects in the world uh, developed during that first six months. And we'll talk at the end about how, how, what kind of techniques are used to understand this learning process, because it's very difficult to extract that knowledge uh, from babies, but uh, there are some clever techniques to do so. This process is characterized by this kind of predictive learning uh, process where essentially we're learning about all this physics just by trying to essentially predict what's going to happen next. And, you know, in physics, what happens next is governed by these basic laws of physics. And so if we are learning based on that, we can kind of internalize those laws of physics and use those to, to predict, uh, you know, what should happen in the, in the visual world. Um, and that's the basis of kind of uh, development of this form of knowledge. Those models are, are things actually we're working on currently uh, in my lab. And, you know, I think there's a lot of promise there but I wouldn't call it a, a, a kind of complete understanding of this process by any means. One tension in this field that still exists is this idea that somehow uh, we're actually born with a lot of this basic physics knowledge versus acquire it through learning. And there are actually people who argue that we are kind of born with this. Elizabeth Spelke is one example who says that these are kind of core knowledge that we're born with. Uh, but uh, other people think, like myself, that in fact, it's, it, these predictive learning mechanisms are, are what are important for actually learning this stuff in the first place. Okay, then after about six months, you really start to develop these motor abilities. You start crawling, reaching, grasping, and you're learning to control those motor actions, coordinate the sensory signals that drive the motor actions. Uh, we also think that this could be uh, learned through these kinds of predictive learning mechanisms, perhaps developing this sort of sense self model and understanding of what it is you can do. And that builds up to the sense of overall kind of agency, uh, the sense of what it is that you can and can't do in the world. And that leads to this miracle at age two, tantrums. <laughs> this is really salient as a parent. All of a sudden the kids start to really have strong opinions about everything. Um, and, and that sense of will, this, this ability to drive that internal control. I mean, again, the whole reason we emphasize control, control, control throughout this course really starts to appear at this critical age, you know, this terrible twos, uh, when tantrums onset and, you know, fundamentally when you see something that powerful, that strong, that's so, that's so compelling you know that's that's something really important and and i think one of the, the things we don't really have good understanding of scientifically uh is you know the the fuel that powers this kind of 
emerging sense of control? How does that magic occur at this kind of turning point uh, when when kids go from being kind of more passive uh, receptor? You know, they are doing some kind of active exploration, but this this sense of like autonomy really developing at this point, uh, I think is one of the great things I think we need to really understand. Uh, this is uh, our kids here, just, uh, you know, they hate to have their picture taken still, um, but uh, it started at an early age. And yeah, this was our family uh, kind of holiday card one year, <laughs> just because the level of, of resistance to taking the picture was truly phenomenal. The joyous of parenting. This kind of active notion of human control, human learning uh, is so important. And I think you really see it as a parent that, you know, your ability to influence your kids gets uh, decreased over time and they exhibit this such a stronger self-directed uh, kind of active control over their own trajectories at that point. Uh, so, yeah, so then, you know, this kind of unfolding of that development of uh, all these higher levels of cognition as a result of that kind of fundamental self-directed exploratory understanding uh, is what takes place over the next, you know, kind of Piaget's pre-operational to operational kind of trajectory, perhaps.